Welcome to the fourth and final episode of our Fragility Fractures in Focus podcast series. Hosted by me, Cesar Libanati, Head of Medical External Affairs and Medical Strategy at UCB. Throughout the series, we've been exploring the latest hot topics and innovations in osteoporosis. We did that with members of the global bone community with an emphasis on the importance of secondary fracture prevention. Our focus has been the four aspects of the P4 model, a framework increasingly recognized as the cornerstone of proactive modern medicine with the four Ps standing for prevention, personalization, participation, and predictiveness. One of the rewarding aspects of being a healthcare provider is that we deal with individuals' unique patients. We should not wonder then that one-size-fits-all approaches many times used have many, many limitations. Personalized medicine refers to the customization of the diagnosis and therapeutic management according to the individual characteristics and the needs of each patient, tailoring then the care to achieve the best possible outcomes. Now, we all know that, but in practice, how close are we to genuinely personalized care in osteoporosis? And is the digital revolution helping drive this paradigm shift? These are the questions we'll be debating in today's episode titled, This Time It's Personal. To help me explore these issues, I'm joined by Dr. Kenneth Poole, Professor of Metabolic Bone Diseases and Consultant Rheumatologist at the NIHR Cambridge Biomedical Research Center in the University of Cambridge. Ken, welcome. Hi, Caesar. Would you mind introducing yourself uh, briefly? Yeah, it's great to, great to speak to you and thank you for inviting me on the podcast. As you say, we've known each other for years um, and this is an area that we share a real interest in uh, with your background uh, in imaging and as well as geriatrics and my background in rheumatology and imaging too. And I think this is going to be one of my favorite topics to discuss. Wonderful. So for all of us who practice uh, medicine for many years, today I think are blessed times. We have come a long way and now we have established clinical definitions, validated methods of fracture risk assessment, and a range of effective treatments for osteoporosis. But is there still a gap as we keep hearing and documenting that many, if not the majority of those at high risk do not receive treatment and are not evaluated? Do you agree with what I just mentioned? And uh, how are you addressing this gap in your practice? Well, to begin with, uh, Caesar. I echo what you said about the, the blessed times that we're in with, with superb diagnostics and tools that we use to give risk stratification. So we should be able to know who's high risk and, and lower risk. We should be able to target our treatments to those at high risk. And yet, I can probably answer your question by talking about my clinic last week. Um, that, Patricia, I am ch changed the name, but let's just say someone who... Um, came into my clinic, the first point of contact with a specialist in osteoporosis with three vertebral fractures, a wedge fracture, grade three, one of these severe wedge fractures at three sites in her thoracic and lumbar spine, um, and in agonizing pain. <clears throat> and while we have, I think we're lucky in Cambridge to have one of the best uh, metabolic bone services and certainly one of the best fracture liaison or pickup services, the trouble is people are still coming through without receiving the personalized care that they, they could receive so that they're, they're flagged as being high risk. And the, the, what makes me particularly sad about Patricia's case is that two years ago she presented with a single, uh, a single moderate thoracic fracture, a single one into A&E. It was all diagnosed and our FLS picked the patient up. But at that point, we weren't able to stratify patients. Now, 
you asked what we're doing about it. And I think one of the, we're not there yet, but one of the things that myself and all the other people who passionately believe in this are trying to do is to get our specialist services configured so that we can get the patients who are most at need into our services quickly and set them on the right path rather than using a kind of a one fits all treatment and 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 while we have great tools with things like frax um what we do at the end of frax with someone with the risk has been modified recently and that really points to when people need to be referred to specialist services you are you, you bring a couple of points that I'd like to ref, reflect more on. The first is uh, I've always been impressed every time we uh, had a chance to discuss uh, a practice and your patients, uh, the number of patients you see who have suffered a multitude of fractures and particularly vertebral fractures. So, uh, and many times they are, they come to you in no treatment at all or in uh, treatments that are still the approach of one size fits all. Um, do you think uh, in, in, in this last uh, few years uh, and presently with the new uh, NIH and uh, NICE um, guidelines, uh, are we um, starting to move the needle? Uh, I, I know your practice is very special, correct? I mean, you're, you're a super specialist, but it will take more than uh, just one can pull to address this tremendous gap. Uh, do you see hope uh, just based on uh, what we're seeing uh, in, in these, again, uh, what should be blessed times for the patients who, who suffered osteoporosis? Yeah, I, I do. And the, th the reason why I think that is because you can just compare the national osteoporosis guidelines from 2017 to 2022. That five-year period meant that so the summary of those guidelines tells us as physicians what we need to do. And even if anyone in care, including patients, were to get hold of them and read down them, they would be simply told that if they were at high risk, if they'd had um, a recent vertebral fracture, if they'd had multiple fractures, like the patient you described and like my patient from last week, um, then, then they should be being referred. And FRAX itself now has that category at the top, which doesn't just say very high risk in the dark red. It says very high risk and consider referral. And if you connect that up, you, you have to redefine your services almost to say they are my biggest priority. They are my lowest hanging fruit. They are the reason I'm getting in in the morning to see patients. I have to see those patients with a vertebral fracture so they don't get three more or four more vertebral fractures and end up. Uh, like my other patient this morning, who's 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 on the ward with about her fifth vertebral fracture, because each one of those to me is a failure, um, and it's awful for the patients. I mean, we, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that untreated osteoporosis is still out there, and even in centres where I work and where other people work, centres of excellence, to, to, the the need now is to configure our services for personalised care, and that starts with those people at highest risk, and. Currently, we have an FLS which will do forearm, tibia, humerus fractures. And actually, it, because of NOG 2022 saying, look, there are these different treatments now. You can give anabolic treatments first. You can give them before other treatments. And that's proven to reduce the risk of problems developing fractures comor and morbidity. That's where I'd love to, to, to see us going. That is great. And I, I, I like to see that uh, you're expanding the FLS systems to capture all, at least all the major osteoporotic fractures, as uh, we know that uh, those uh, result in, in a tremendous increase in the near term of uh, more fractures. Uh, however, uh, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot here. I, I noticed that you, 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 many of your statements were qualified by the if, if we refer, if we do that. You know, the, the French have a saying that the states with enough ifs, you could fit Paris inside of a little bottle. Um, yeah, so so th there's obviously uh, opportunities for improvement in order to achieve this more personalized medicine where the right patient gets an opportunity to access the, the right treatment according to, uh, to experts' uh, guides and, and recommendations. 
do you think uh, that the digital tools that are emerging, the use of AI, uh, could help there uh, in order to uh, to make some uh, some improvements? Uh, are you are you working on any of that? Uh, is that something that is happening in Cambridge? What are your thoughts? So. Well, I can answer that question in in two broad categories. Um, in the Royal Osteoporosis Society, we wrote two um, pieces um, about one about opportunistic detection of fractures, vertebral fractures, but the other one about digital technologies for osteoporosis care in general. But one of the really exciting things about digital technologies um, that's that's coming in osteoporosis is where you take a patient who has access to pretty much all resources that you you or I as physicians have, and c they can use the online tools or, or particular software tools to actually work their own way through their, you know, their risk factors and the situation they're in and the medications and the types of um, exercises calcium supplements, vitamin D, lifestyle choices, and it gives them an idea of um, what their risk is over the next 10 years, and then gives them a choice. And I've seen uh, firsthand, only as part of the data monitoring committee, but I've seen things like IFRAP run by Professor Zoe Paskins, which does exactly what I said. And, and you know, it, these things can be really dry. Oh, well, type in your, your, your height, your weight, whether your parents fractured, whether, you, you know, whether you've had a vertebral fracture. But increasingly, these are becoming really sophisticated. So, so your, let's take my patient, Patricia, and, and, then, and then say what would optimum be for her. The optimum for her in these kind of tech-savvy ages would be that she actually goes to the website or the IFRAP site or whatever it is. This isn't too far away. It's not present now, but it, it's on the horizon types in what she's had, types in height, weight, risk factors, smoking status, the rest of it. And it pops out to her and says, look, you're in a really high risk factor group. And even then you need some help because no one knows what that means. Um, what does it mean to have a really high risk of vertebral fractures, a really high risk of hip fracture? Well, things like the IFRAP have got a little animation of vertebral fractures, you know, of what they do to somebody's back. And, and that's, you know, that's what I spend my, my clinical time trying to, you know, lock the door after the horse has bolted a lot of the time where someone's had so many fractures. So so imagine the patient going through a digital tool like that and they come to you with the with the um the the output of that digital tool and it says, right, to the primary care, the the, the GP it says, I need to come to the specialists. I've done this tool. And then and, and and part of the thing with the tool is because all of our all of our medications have, you know, downsides and upsides, yeah. So 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 that tool works through those at the forefront so you're not sitting there with someone and having a battle about whether they want to take drug x or drug y they're actually going i've read about this and this is the one i want i've read that it's better than such and such or it's you know and this is what suits my lifestyle or whatever and that's true personalized medicine so that so that's like i mean i don't want to pause there because that's where one of our position papers in in digital medicine led us to imagine the future it, it is thanks. Uh, it's uh, good good thoughts, and uh, uh, as you said, uh, it's nice to see that uh, the tools are there, the opportunity is there. Um, can we, nevertheless, uh, help in a, in a more grandiose way improve on it? Uh, after all, we're talking about uh, going to the mountain, correct? Having the patient go to the to the website, etc. Can we instead think about how do we bring the mountain to the patient? I mean, I can imagine a world where, for example, as a patient, I mean, I think it exists today, technically, the, the patient walks through the, through the entrance of the hospital, the clinic, or, or even in the streets. And uh, I, I'm sure the cameras know who they are. I know they already have logged their, their phones and their emails. Uh, we as doctors cannot secure that uh, that information, but uh, you know the the government uh, the, does have it. Uh, could the could the camera detect uh, if she has kyphosis? Uh, if if we can do it visually, uh, an iPad, a camera can do it as well, and then alert them early on of those some things and, and many other risk factors. You know, a patient who who has a gait that is not uh, that stable. Uh, those things could could revolutionize and, and potentially have a great impact. 
and and then they, those could be alerted directly to uh, to the patient in a way that uh, that would not overwhelm them, but uh, could help them. Uh, do, do you do you think this is too futuristic? Are there disadvantages about thinking that way? No, I, no, I no, I don't. I mean, I think look at look at the technological advances that have happened to date. Um, I suppose that kyphosis detect. I never even thought of that, and that's amazing. You know, that's brilliant. You, you, with the surveillance cameras picking up the kyphosis or this, you know, this unsteady gate. That's great. I mean, really simple things that I think, um, again, that I've not seen exploited. We have EMR Epic, the 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 US system for. Um, for measuring, uh, you know, recording clinical information. And I've always wondered why we get an alert to say someone's, you know, grade one, two, three obesity. Why don't we get an alert to say they've lost three inches of height? Why doesn't it flash up the same way as the obesity? You might be wanting going down the obesity pile. This person's gone from BMI, you know, 35 to 40. Why don't we get the same when it says um, when someone's lost two or three inches of height? Because we're measuring, we're feeding it in. So I think those are great. I mean, I think... One of the things we did with the Royal Osteoporosis Society uh, technology um, in the Bone Academy, uh, led by uh, Juliet Compston, was put together this kind of ideal scenario where a patient has a fracture. Say it's a vertebral fracture. And we wrote this down and sort of we could see a situation where she, you know, she immediately gets diagnosed using, using it could be anything but computer-aided technology artificial intelligence, just educated radiologists, something, it's flagged. The flagging of that fracture links directly to a fracture liaison service. It links to, and, and, and it's immediate. She doesn't have to make an appointment. She gets, she gets information to her how to manage with her vertebral fracture, what exercises to do, the stuff that you and I have been doing in clinical interfaces, you know, all the time with, you can do the cat stretch, but do it really gently. There's not very much you can do until about the second or third month. All right? These are the analgesics that work. This is at what point you're going to start to be able to do a different sort of stretch. This one here. It it points to, right, it, and, it, and it then connects up with an appointment with an FLS practitioner. The practitioner then says, right, you, you, you need a DEXA scan now. And that's ordered automatically. The results are tied up automatically. And, and these tools, they're so near... Caesar, when you, when you work with a thing like Epic or you know other EMRs, it's just connecting the dots together, so that when when that person comes, they're suddenly fast tracked to first on the list of my clinic, saying, "Look, this person's really high risk. They fulfil NOG 2022. This is what's happened. This is the bone density. You know, this this is whatever else um, might be needed for for you know for for fracture risk. Maybe it's maybe it's Q risk." Maybe, you know, all those things are done and, and the information is out there. And then we can add in your, uh, yeah, we can no, add in your when they walk into clinic, it can automatically <laughs> pick up the, the kyphosis. I mean, well, you know. It, it, it is wonderful that uh, indeed uh, you and uh, the ROS, uh, NOG, et cetera, have contributed uh, so much already. And uh, as you said, those tools are coming. And I have two follow-up questions on that. Um, uh, the, f the first uh, one is... A, are you able uh, to, in your clinic, adapt and uh, how difficult or easy was it to, as you said, bring those patients to the forefront? Um, because one of the issues we keep hearing about um, some of the medical systems is that, yeah, very nice, you got to identify the patient or whatever, but then the waiting times could be forever. Um, that's the first question. And, and, uh, and uh, another uh, the question is, one of... My uh, concerns about all this those technologies is that uh, we're only touching the tip of the iceberg, correct? So these technologies have the potential to immediately inundate, overwhelm the systems. I mean, we we know there's not enough geriatricians, rheumatologists to take care of all these patients. So are we thinking ahead as these methods will come through, uh, through you know medical devices or even through uh, Major companies, Apple, uh, Google, uh, or Amazon will have devices that uh, will probably do that before we uh, uh, put them in place as, as physicians. Are, are we preparing? Are we conscious of, of, of the tremendous number of patients that could be suddenly appear, you know, queuing in, in front of your clinic? 
Caesar, you've you've asked the. I mean, you've dug to the most important question, really. Um, the rate limiting step in all these superb, um, these superb service changes, is that if I think of the five best, most effective medications in osteoporosis, I can put straight out there. They rely in in my hospital and region of of East Anglia on a on a specialist to to commence them by prescription. It's not the same in in all over the world, uh, but that's the way it is locally. <clears throat> now, just solely focusing on that aspect of professional having to the the specialist having to commence those five superb medications, we would be inundated. And that is a situation that we have to, that's the next uh, um, service, uh, uh, the service block that we've got to overcome. Now, you might ask, you know, how do we do that? Well, our specialist nurses are absolutely superb. Um, I mean, I couldn't do without Chloe and Yolanta in my team. They're, you know, they're, they're the kind of people who, who are specialists in osteoporosis and they, they're part of the solution to this. And unfortunately, it does mean that in that sense, we need to expand what we're able to offer so that we don't, as you say, have people queuing out the door. But it's also why I answered your earlier question about digital medicine, because I think that if people know where they are on the pathway, if they're aware and if primary care, if GPs are aware too, then what we get as referrals will be the people we need to be seeing. Now, I'm, you know, it, I've painted a picture about not, not everyone coming through the door sorted, but plenty of people are sorted in East Anglia for osteoporosis. But and then at the same time, I have loads of discussions with people who just want to come and, and chat about their risk. They might not have had any fractures. They might have a low BMD. They're very worried. Now, there are other places where they can go for information on that. And, and, and one thing I would say is I think I'd rather, you know, what is it, um, a sick person and needs a doctor, but a well person doesn't need the doctor. You know, so that's one area where I can see we are better off spending our time in the high risk patients. So if it does cause this large amount of patients, then that's that's what we have to do. We have to configure our services so the highest risk people are seen first. Now, you're, I think, referring in your question to the identification opportunistically of high risk fracture patients with who or people who've had a vertebral fracture. And that's work that, that you've done, that, that um, um, artificial intelligence companies are converging on, uh, particularly in the field of CT, computed tomography scans. Now, the numbers there are astonishing. The numbers of versatile fracture patients who are identified through um, CT scanning is astonishing. And um, we had an artificial intelligence tool switched on, and we could debate about whether they are useful or work creation machines, uh, you know, ha given how well they work at the moment, which is just reasonably. Uh, but, you know, immediately you, you identify, say, 300 people a month that you weren't aware of who had a vertebral fracture in their, uh, you know, in their spines on the CT data set. Now, the first piece of work, Caesar, is to find if they even need to see us, if, if that vertebral fracture even needs to come to us, because a huge component of those people with the CTs have got Malignancy, cancer follow-up, are already on treatment. Uh, they are less clear, but 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 they are important, as you say, and uh, and we have been working on that in order to again not just generate more work, but uh, see the opportunity. After all, uh, you have taught me, and I've heard you say so many times that the patients with vertebral fractures uh, are are the patients uh, that are the landmark to, to be treated. Correct? Those are have the highest uh, risk of having more fractures. All the medications we have have the highest efficacy in preventing uh, further fractures. And as you say, there are a number of uh, very effective medications that can be used. Yet, uh, as in your institution, 300, maybe even more patients go through the resistance because they're, they're being seen and getting a CT scan for whatever reason. And... Uh, they go completely undetected. It's it's a bit appalling that in this in, in these days of this incredible technologies and tools we have, we have not yet cracked that. But I would agree with you that we need to think about that. Is the is this in the radar of the major societies, of you know the major osteoporosis societies in the world, all the big experts, uh, enough, or should we keep? Uh, 
voicing that, hey guys, let's get ready for this because it's, I think perhaps, and unlike European, that the right thing to do, the smart thing to do, and what is going to prevent uh, further expenditures on what would be an incredible epidemic as our populations keep aging. To answer your question about the the local three hundred, right? I need to do it. I need to tell you about uh, the fact that Emma Geraghty and Dan Chapel here in in Adambrook's hospital are picking up eighty one percent of those already. And when we did a national audit and joined that audit, we were this was the h- highest amount. So it's normally about. 30% of those fractures are picked up if you look at audits of CT. But we, and the reason that those Dan and, and Emma got to 81% was because they had a brilliant approach to this is what I mentioned the earlier some of the simplest things. They put a sagittal CT scan series in with every CT scan that was done. That bumped it up from 30 to 50% pickup because the, the radiologist reporting could just see it. Oh, there's a fracture there. They can't see it on the cuts that you see, axial cuts. So that was the first thing. Then Emma went to town on education and she put up all these brilliant Star Wars posters and things about the fractures and just reporting them with a single code. VXP, use this code. If you write VXP, there is a vertebral fracture present. Then the FLS can pick it up afterwards. That pushed us from the final bit between 50 and 80% because the, the, every one of the radiology team were enthusiastic and she would report back to them, you're doing great. So Look, something so simple with no technology can get you up to about 81% identification, right? So, but then you, you then get sort of into AI and I don't, yeah, so, so you can't infuse every team in every hospital in the country, but could, and you say, could the societies get behind this? Right, they could. But the theme of the Royal Osteoporosis Society Conference next, uh, the, next week here in the UK, Manchester, is, um, is equity across healthcare. So yeah, we get to 81% in Cambridge, brilliant. Oxford's brilliant, right? But what if what about if you're, you know, not if you're not in those two centers? And that's where an I the AI tool plugged in. And you can imagine because you have a I think you have a system bone bot, is that right? Where you can identify, you know, you have your own internal system. So you plug it in, but you need to plug it in centrally so that each each individual organization is ha- isn't having to procure and and, and find this. And and the UK is a brilliant place to start with that because we have a thing called the IEP, the Image Exchange Portal. So any scan can move anywhere at a click of a button between any hospital. That's wonderful. And uh, lots of ideas on things to uh, keep working together uh, to to bring improvements to our patient outcomes. That's that's great. I always get inspired uh, when I talk to you. And by the way, thanks you for all the all these tips because I'm sure our uh, podcast listeners are uh, well, may want to contact you or uh, or uh, hear more about uh, all the individuals you're mentioning who obviously are doing important things and are uh, showing that with sometimes simple, uh, not complicated, uh, small changes, you can bring improvements in the quality and at the end of the day, improvements in the health of, uh, of the patients. So moving to the last uh, part of the of the podcast, I'd like to, uh, to talk a little bit about um, the, the the concept uh, from a from a patient point of view about uh, digital tools, about uh, are they cautious that in somehow this is quote unquote invading their privacy, which I personally think is an overstated uh, uh, statement because it's for their own for for their own you know good and wealth and well being. But but it's it, it is a hot topic. It, it, it is a controversial topic. Um, do you think patients in general? Uh, respond uh, in a positive way to you tell them, hey, by the way, you know, you were detected with this or that, or or the camera noticed that you uh, you shuffled as you entered the hospital, and, and therefore we like to send you for an evaluation for your gate. Uh, um, is how do we how do we approach this this uh, sometimes difficult topic with the patients, or do you think uh, it's something to worry about at all? That's a really good really good question, and we. We have a trial called Phoenix here, a National Institute for Health Research. NIHR is our sort of NHS, our um, funding body for research. And, and Phoenix, one of the things they said is, if you're going to be detecting all these vertebral fractures and doing it behind the scenes, if you were, yes, all the people are consented at the point of going in for their CT. They, For Phoenix, they would just pick up a self-consent form and say, look, I'm having a CT. And you could extend this to vertebral fractures. You could extend it to 
calcium in the in the aorta or in the cal cal calcified arteries, right? But it also had a free form. Please tell us what you think of this. If you even if you said no to the trial, just tell us what you think of, of being approached at this point. And then the NIHR said you must employ someone to do specific interviews of people who said yes to the trial and who got some findings. And the GPs and the and the radiographers, you have to interview everyone and do it scientifically to find out what they thought of it. And actually, um, although the results aren't all in yet, um, we've had Jane Fleming doing that. It's a type of research I'm not fully familiar with, but when she does this qualitative research and she shows us the interviews, I mean, there's the great the majority of people are just really pleased that they got something else for free that they didn't know about that was inside that we can do something about. You must have like about one in a hundred who says, um, I wasn't happy with, you know, but they tend to write and they don't, they don't um, consent and they'll say something like, I've got so much on, I've got cancer diagnosis. I just can't cope with this at the moment. So I think one of the things is, is it, that's the key. That's the fork in the road is to say, you know, yeah, we found you've got a really severe vertebral fracture. If that person is in end of life care. Um, then you're you're not going to your your duty is not to to leap around trying to optimize their vertebral fracture management if they're in end of life care and palliation. Um, that's for their that's for their oncology team and palliative care team to sort. So the the one light I've had in this is um the guy called um Terence Ong working with Apinda Sahota in Nottingham. They went through this exact thing. They turned on an AI tool called Optasia run out of Manchester. And they had 850 fractures in three months, you know. But if in their paper, they put in an appendix, which just said, look, we couldn't do this. We couldn't cope. And all these people don't all want to know. So they put in an algorithm, which the, 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 the supplement for that paper is amazing. And it just tells you about what kind of malignancy, what kind of metastatic malignancy they're not going to follow up. They're not going to follow up if someone's just had a diagnosis of cancer with a follow up with a FLS. They're not, yeah, and, they, and they also said, well, we will follow up. This is stable disease, stable malignancy, and on just routine follow-up. So I think that's answering it in, in, certain, in certain ways of uh, the point of entry. I think, I think you have to remember um, that the algorithms are there. They're powerful and they're potent, and they're not entirely benign. Uh, so I like it when there's a human being overseeing the outputs and what I, I quite like about the um, the artificial intelligence tools, the ones that I've seen, is where it gives you the final click, yes, no. And Dan Chapel, who I mentioned earlier, with Judith Adams in my team, they're they're spending a lot of time on the electronic record, saying, "Well, look what look at this patient. This is really not appropriate to go forward with that. Yes, it's identified a fracture, but this is not someone we're going to be taking forward." And that's because of the population coming in for CT, um, and. The th other thing to remember is that patients are one click away from the worst type of information on the web, um, and you know one of the one of the battlegrounds, if you like, is to, like I mentioned, IFRAP earlier, and the Royal Osteoporosis Society, is to get the patient with the recent diagnosis to the right information. That's not going to be, um, you know, we're regulated. You and I are regulated in everything we can say now. In our clinical practice, what we write on our websites, what we publish in our papers, but there is a—it's the wild west out there on the internet. And and one of my biggest concerns about AI is you already have people who are toxic um, in terms of the routine and proven me medications for osteoporosis, or you know, or, or the way of managing severe osteoporosis, and. AI is only going to make that worse because those are algorithms that drive people towards the wrong information. And, and as a clinician with 25 years experience, the number of times I'm increasingly seeing people who've said, well, I, I know that this causes this and, and I know it to be true. And they may even be clutching a whole load of, um, you know, the wrong research papers or whatever else it is. So, so that's one of the concerns of AI. Thank you, Ken, for all your thoughts. Um, <clears throat> You don't know how uh, wonderful it is to hear you uh, elicit uh, and challenging us and uh, tell us about uh, all your uh, successes and your frustrations, which is part of being a human being and part of applying personalized medicine. Ken, any uh, departing words? We learn from our peers and something I learned from Kasim Javed in Oxford just yesterday 
is here's 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 a simple thing that they did, and it and it's brilliant. So you go to the emergency department. If you have somebody with a recent bursible fracture, it's picked up on X-ray. Maybe it's picked up on CT, and it's confirmed. Their FLS is identifying um, the the vertebral fracture uh, patient, sending them for a DEXA scan, arranging the appointment. Now, I, I'm so proud of that the, the fracture liaison service locally run by Madhavi even the Cherivu is outstanding. And we have a, a national dashboard that tells us so. And when I saw this, I thought that's each of us has our own thing that we can do. And I learned that from Cass yesterday. I said, right, we can go and we can try and make that work here. Yeah, because I think, you know, what sometimes the problem looks so big, you have to take a real small part of it and say, I can fix that small part right now. Great point, great point. And uh, uh, you remind me of Maria Tala, who was a guest in our previous podcast, who also has put in place a number of these small, uh, I would even call them common sense approaches that, uh, in her experience, have really changed uh, the, the practice uh, and, and, and changed the way uh, the nurses and the FLS and, uh, and all the healthcare feel about uh, all the good they're doing. So it's rewarding uh, as physicians and as people who provide care. I, I like to perhaps summarize uh, three uh, key messages or key aspects that I, I took from, uh, from this podcast, from this conversation. The, the first one is that uh, we are living in, in, in the care of osteoporosis uh, in a wonderful time. Uh, you know, we talk about the wonderful diagnostic tools, the treatment options. You, you mentioned the many wonderful, uh, I'm quoting you, uh, the drugs that we have, um, the, 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 the help with the guidelines, uh, all, all the help available. Yet a gap still exists, and uh, many of the patients that need to desperately to be treated because they are at the highest risk still do not. So... It is a little bit of a call uh, to action to all to all of us uh, in, in that regard. Uh, the second one is that uh, I think uh, through your uh, practice and what's happening, the future is here, eh? and uh, and already or soon more improvements faster than we even dream are, are coming, particularly in patient identification. So uh, my take on that is let's make sure that we're not. Uh, taken by surprise, uh, and again, a call to action to uh, to be smart about what's coming, to be proactive, uh, to start talking, uh, networking, and uh, finding out what some other groups are doing. And the third one is that we can't be cavalier about about all this. Uh, and in some ways, uh, as I was mentioning, it is a call to action to all of us. You know, all the listeners of this podcast, we need to think about. What we can do, small or big, in our own practices to uh, to bring the change that is so much needed. After all, as the title of this podcast, it is personal, and and personal starts with our own you know actions. And and in that regard, again, I want to thank you and thank all the uh, all all the listeners. I want to remind everybody uh, that um, we have a podcast series on the fragility fractures focus. Uh, those are uh, posted on uh, Spotify, and uh, I would like to remind everybody to stop by and attend and say hi. We'll be present at ASBMR, so look us up. Uh, we love to network here. Again, your insights, everybody contributes uh, to, uh, to the improvement in patient care to make this uh, personalized medicine an even greater reality. So Ken, again, thank you so much uh, to all. Thank you for listening, and now go and have a wonderful day.